Hi everyone, am I audible? Mm, could someone tell me if I'm audible and if the screen is visible? All right, thanks Shubhi. So let's maybe wait for a couple of minutes if more people are joining in. So how has week two gone for everyone? Are you finding it interesting so far, the course? Yes, no, thumbs up, thumbs down. No one has gone through, have you gone through the course content for this, this week too? Okay, so we'll need to make this a little more interactive. You'll need to respond. Feel free to use the chat box. This is uh, not going to be a uh, lecture. It's going to be more interactive. You will have to answer questions and then we'll have discussions. So tell me a little bit about uh, everyone's background. Are you, uh, is there anybody from ecology or everybody is from a different field? You can use the chat box. Is this all new to you or you know something of ecology and uh, you have joined this to learn more? Okay, so Shubhi is new. That's nice. Shubhi, what's your background in? Or what are you studying or what have you studied? I think that is computer science. Is that computer science engineering? All right, okay, nice to have you here. Are you uh, enjoying the course so far? All right, what about the others? Om is enjoying the course so far, nice to have you too. What is your background in Om? IT. Okay, great. Awesome. Good to have you here. Sankha says she, they have unrolled today. Great. Good to have you too. What is your background in? Are you from ecology, non-ecology? Anybody else? Oh wow, that's great. Uh, do you have you uh, have you tried out anything yet? Do you have any links that you would like to share that everybody could have a look at of uh, any of your, if you have made any films so far? Like feel free to share them. I'm sure we'd all like to see. But yeah, great to have you too. Alright, so I'm going to wait for another one minute to see if we have more people joining. Uh, so I am, you are doing wildlife photography as a hobby. That's great. Awesome. So you have been out uh, and you have probably done a lot of observations. That's good. 
good to have you here you would like to take it up seriously yeah sure why not uh, i think uh, india has quite a lot of uh, several prominent wildlife photographers um who cover various different things and you would definitely know them so yeah might be good to uh, connect with them if you haven't already and uh, see where it takes you <laughs> sure sure yes it is definitely it's possible uh, i think there are several several famous indian wildlife pho- wildlife filmmakers and photographers all right so we are uh, let's start right now so i am chiti arvind uh, the uh, one of your three course tas for this course in uh, wildlife ecology i hope you have all had the chance to go through uh, week 2's course content um yes no please feel free to unmute to answer raise your hand to uh, answer because i actually don't know if you can even hear me i'm guessing you can uh feel free to use a chat box we definitely need to have uh, as many discussions as possible because uh yeah otherwise let's have let's make this class a little more interactive so um i am going to start with the first question uh the screen is visible to everyone right let me know if it is changing or not all right okay So what are the examples of hierarchy in nature and who is the founder of the hierarchical theory So what are examples of hierarchy any ideas about what are the what are examples what is hierarchy in nature primary secondary and tertiary okay sankha would you like to give any examples maybe to explain feel free to unmute yourself also and talk if you are okay with that else uh, yeah you can continue to use the chat box anybody else would like to add on hierarchy in food chain okay so no we are not talking about yeah thanks for asking that question i this is not hierarchy in food chain but it is hierarchy in the form of uh, an organizational unit species and genus okay that is a way of uh, organization in taxonomy that is correct sure that is uh, our organizational classification in taxonomy as o mentions shuban says cell tissue organ body okay that is a form of uh, organization and uh, um uh, type of hierarchy okay niche ecology ecotone environment habitat okay um right so i think this is a bit more nuanced um i think there are so this the terms that you have put here don't follow a particular organizational structure but um like for example ecology and environment can be uh, can refer to a very very broad range but uh, more along the lines of what uh, 
Shubhanj has mentioned cell, tissue, organ, body, and then you have the ecological levels of organization that are hierarchical in nature. Right? Population? Ah. Hi, Rajeshri. Community? Yes. Yeah, hi, madam. Hi. Good evening. Yeah. Good evening. Subcellular, organelle, cell, tissue, organ. Okay. Uh, then organism, population, community, ecosystem, biome, and biosphere. Okay. So you have nailed it all. So yes, those are the organizations in ecology, right from... Uh, yeah, I think you have mentioned all the levels, so that's great. Thanks a lot, Rajshri. So yeah, you have a lot of examples of hierarchy in nature and mostly it means that what is hierarchy in nature? What is it like the theory of hierarchy means that um, single units, when they come together, uh, the sum of the whole is greater than individual parts, right? So that's the underlying principle of the hierarchical theory. And uh, would you know who is the founder of the hierarchical theory? Does any name pop up? Abraham Maslow. Okay. Is that so? I have not heard. But no, not in this case. Yes, correct. Thanks, Sanvika. It is uh, indeed uh, Simon, who is the founder of the hierarchical theory. So, yes, do remember that. Let's go on to the next question. So, what does the emergent, what is the emergent principle and could you list a few examples of the emergent principle? This is a part of your course content and it is there in one of the lectures. Anyone emergent principle? Well, I kind of already gave it away in the previous slide. Yes, Om. Uh, properties of the whole, whole more value than the parts. Yes, would you like to explain this a bit further, perhaps with an example? Feel free to unmute yourself or use the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the centipede? Would anyone else like to describe a little bit more about the centipede or any more examples of uh, the emergent principle? Yes, correct, Nanal. Yes, you are right. Whole have the properties its parts do not have. Would you like to give some examples? Mm, yes. So, yes. What is the case in the red ant? What happens? Single versus many. Fire ants hydrophobia. Okay, what's happening in fire ants hydrophobia? Okay, single ones will drown, but
what happens when they are all together where a collection we create a buoyant like structure ball like structure that helps in buoyancy and then they can float yeah awesome so when they are individual individually present in the water they are likely to drown but if they are present in uh, groups that are larger than a single and they form a kind of uh, hydrophobic structure that repels water hydro means water phobic means hating and they kind of float in the water and they make a raft like structure right so they are able to uh, cross from one place to another if they are all together or if they need to if they find themselves um if the find their habitat has been taken over by water for under any um environmental circumstances they can resort to survival techniques by employing uh this method that helps them form a raft by all of them coming together so this is been covered i think in a pnas paper or a cell paper i'm not sure but the links given in the um um uh, lectures as well so what about uh, can you think of any other example that uh, looks at uh, the emergent principle also an example in nature yes you are right om uh any idea of what is the structure like in termites you are correct about uh, the termites as well gopal would you like to add on bees okay okay we are we are uh, getting to something so yeah tell me about termites and bees what is common in termites and bees what is common between termites and bees these can work in isolation correct so yes you are right and uh, if we talk about bees or even termites what is uh, interesting about bees and termites why can they work in isolation you have brought up a very interesting point uh who says colony stay uh yes they stay in colonies and why can't they work in isolation why can't one bee do everything yes so exactly so bees have a social hierarchy and they have a division of labor what do you mean by division of labor they are workers drone queens etc so what i was trying to get at are is that termites and bees are examples of uh social insects right yes and each one uh is uh of a particular type someone have a question Okay, Ra, uh, Rajeshri and Akash. Akash, would you like to add something? Rajeshri, would you like to add something? Yeah, 
okay so moving back to the concept so each one yes uh, does a, sp a specific uh, task and uh, there are several categories of workers queen bee etc that uh, um, you all have mentioned about so they have uh, division of labor as someone has already mentioned and each particular type of or category of um, insect in that species individual in that species performs a specific task so uh, they are all social insects and they need to all work together to be able to you know have their social structure sustain and for them to carry about their lives so bees are uh, uh, extremely altruistic okay we will not be covering altruism right now but uh, maybe we can discuss this uh, at the point where we are discussing about behavior and altruism etc so uh, prashanta uh, please uh, do explain um, this you feel free to talk more about this concept at that time all right so i think uh, all of us now have been able to understand something about the emergent principle so let's move on so a uh, collection of tissues a collection of systems a collection of organisms a collection of cells so what is an organ yeah feel free to use the chat box okay everybody unanimously agrees that uh, an organ is a collection of tissues so uh, is an organ a collection of tissues of uh, the same type or different type same type different type different and same both same type okay mixed answers okay so one two Three of you say it's the same type. Akash says different and same both. Any other thoughts, answers? Nobody else. How many of us are here today? We are about twenty-six people. Twenty-six to twenty-seven people. Only four people have an opinion of this. What do the others feel? If different uh, tissues ma'am different tissues okay so rajshree also says different tissues okay so let's take okay vinota says different what else okay so let's uh, let's let's maybe take an example to understand this better uh, let's take the example of a heart so what types of tissues are present in the heart cardiac okay cardiac tissues are well heart tissues but if we break it down into tissue types what all tissue types do you have okay so you have muscle yeah you have the cardiac muscle so you have muscle tissues then what else what else do you need for the heart to function
no no one no one knows uh, what tissues could be in the heart tissue types so muscle yes the heart predominantly does consists of muscular tissue then we also have uh, connective tissue right the blood is another type of connective tissue so you have blood that um and also um you have um, what else nervous tissue because you have a lot of nerves that are innervating the heart that perform also several functions and uh, then it's also composed of um, a membrane right like the heart is composed also it has some epithelial membrane so it does have epithelial tissue also so all these when they come together to form your organ known as a heart uh, it 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 is comprised of several different kinds of tissue right okay so basically what i'm trying to get at is that an organ is comprised of a collection of different types of tissues it's not the same type of tissue uh, what is a collection of cells called two people say tissue three people say tissue okay okay so yeah so a collection of cells becomes a tissue right and collection of the same kind of cell out here in this case what about a collection of organisms what is a collection of similar organisms known as population yes that's correct so a collection of organisms is known as a population um yeah do feel free to unmute yourselves and talk if you are able to also it need not be just using the chat box but yes uh feel free to use a chat box if you are in a situation where it's difficult for you to unmute okay so let's move on right so what is the lowest level of organization where a food chain comes into play is it at the ecosystem level is it at the community level is it at the population level or is it at the biome level what is the lowest level of organization where a food chain comes into play you also have a diagrammatic representation of an example to the side okay so prashanta says uh, community level what about others population madam okay rajeshri says population level adib says population level what else a rupesh says ecosystem level lakshya says population level okay so we currently have population level leading followed by one for community and one for ecosystem come on people uh, sankha says community what else what else what do the others feel about this Vinoda says population. Community. Himanshu says community. Himanshu says community. Okay, Rajeshri. Ma'am, uh, is it Boyo? <laughs> you can choose anyone. We will discuss. Would you like to stick to population or switch Because to biome? Because food, when it comes to food chain, I think it is a biome. Okay, okay. So Rajeshri says biome. Let's go with that. Bala says ecosystem, Vinoda says population, Om says community, Nishan says community, Akash says no. <laughs> I'm not sure in response to what that is. 
but uh, okay so we have a mixed bag would anyone like to uh, justify their answer as to why they chose that rajeshri gave an example would anyone else like to take a stab at explaining himanshu yeah go ahead hello hello hi yeah hello actually madam uh, a community is consist of a group of population mm -hmm. so that uh, and if you consider mm -hmm. a population as a and then as a profit level mm -hmm. so that the uh, and when one population fit another mm -hmm. means uh, the transfer of the food energy mm -hmm. as well as the food also takes place okay okay so what is your answer himanshu uh, community community okay okay thanks thanks himanshu so i think uh, himanshu did uh, touch upon some points well so the answer is actually uh, b community level and uh, as uh, himanshu mentioned has so so we can see examples of your food chain here right so you have a, one is an, a terrestrial ecosystem and one is a marine ecosystem now if you follow the arrows i'm not sure if my pointer can be seen but if you can see my mouse uh, you will see that both the starting of the food chain starts with your primary producers etc and goes higher up in the food chain so what is what is interesting out here is that you can see that there are different species in this so now your population level automatically gets eliminated because why does population get eliminated population level can anyone guess what is a population same species yes so that's important right so a population is an aggregation of individuals of the same species so uh, here in a food chain you cannot have a food chain in within the same species right so you definitely have an interplay of multiple species that come together so it uh, it has to be the next level of organization which is known as a community right so a community is where you get your answer from and a community is an association of multiple types of populations from across different species that come together right so we go as uh, himanshu correctly mentioned we increase in the trophic levels and uh, energy consumption is deposited as we go higher up the food chain right so the lowest level of organization where a food chain comes into play is community yes you do have food chains in the ecosystem and the biome level as well but out here i have specifically asked which is the lowest level of organization so here it is the community right okay so let's move on to the next question uh what is an example of the basic structural and functional unit of life is it the nucleus is it the cell is it the chromosome or is it the mitochondria okay lots of answers coming in we have a good level of participation here i okay sell what about the others what about the 15 other people out here mitochondria 
Okay, Raj. Hi, Rajshree. Yeah, okay. So, is it mitochondria? Yes. Okay. So, Rajshree goes with mitochondria. Okay, so I think uh, majority of you have mentioned cell, which is uh, the correct answer. Yes, it is the basic structural and functional unit of life is known as the cell. Components of the cell are, yes, as Akash mentions, it is, uh, they are all three parts of a cell. So these are all known as organelles that form a cell. You have the nucleus, chromosome and mitochondria. So yes, it is not. Uh, it is the cell and not the mitochondria, which is this basic structural and functional unit of life. So let's switch gears and look at a bit of things at the ecosystem or community level. So here you have two kinds of landscapes, A, B, and C, D, and there are three types of diversity represented. So um, it's a really nice diagrammatic representation of these three types of diversity. Would someone like to explain the types of diversity out here? One of them might you might have heard them you might have heard about quite commonly. You can look at the image uh, Himanshu. Would you like to uh, try and explain? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Actually, yeah. ma'am, the first one is the alpha diversity. Mm -hmm. So, alpha diversity is the diversity of the species that present in a particular area. Okay. So, it is the alpha diversity. Okay. What do you then mean by that? Diversity. Could you, yeah, could you explain Sir, that? Al yes, yes. Uh, Go and, ahead. And this, for example, and there is a forest. Mm -hmm. And then, the species diversity of that forest mm -hmm. and you consider forest as ecosystem mm -hmm. and whatever the number and whatever number of species is present in that particular forest mm -hmm. and uh, this is the alpha diversity okay and if you come to the then uh, and if you go to explain the uh, the two ecosystem mm -hmm. it is the beta diversity okay and then over a large area mm -hmm. and you consider it is a large area or a landscape and this uh, then this comes under the gamma diversity Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, thanks, Simanchu. Thanks for the explanation. Would uh, anyone else like to build on what Himanshu has mentioned right now about the three types of diversity? Anyone else would like to add on Himanshu's um, explanation of alpha, beta and gamma diversity? So here you can see two landscapes that are given um, and uh, alpha diversity as Himanshu mentioned is the diversity of a particular area or an ecosystem, right? So this is often denoted by species, uh, the types of species that are present in it, correct? But if we look at the change in species diversity between two of these ecosystems then we are looking at beta diversity so beta diversity is nothing but a comparison of diversity between ecosystems right so out here you can see as an example they have shown different kinds of fish and uh, when you look at a comparison of diversity in site A and site B, when you look at a comparison between any two sites, it constitutes as beta diversity. And what is gamma diversity? It is a measure of overall diversity for different ecosystems within a region, right? So, as we go from alpha to gamma, we just increase also the scale at what we are looking at diversity in, right? So, the smallest scale in which we look at diversity. Uh, bio, uh, biodiversity and diversity in the plant and animal world is alpha diversity. Alright, I hope uh, this was clear to everyone.
we can move on to the next question so in the field of ecology what is the basic functional unit is it a cell is it an organism is it a biome or is it a population okay sankha says biome what about the others organism okay population what about the others what do you feel what about the others what do you feel about this what is the basic functional unit in the field of ecology okay so yes the basic functional unit in the field of ecology is known as an organism because we start uh, at the ecology organizational level with an organism or an individual so anything below organism does not fall in the ecological level of organization so cell is definitely ruled out so it is an organism okay let's move to the next thing so what do these so there are several images that are given out here what do these images uh look like feel free to use the chat box there are several images here you have uh let me just point towards them this is one this is another one this these two images are attached to each other so this is a representation of what is out here in the circle and this is your other image so feel free to sh uh, talk about what are what do the images given here explain okay prashanta says uh, animal trails are in marks renal says pug mark pug mark okay yeah what else all these images depict ecology they depict ecology um, all all together okay uh, right all trees and of uh, uh, animals organisms right right so what i'm trying to get at is if you are out in a forest and if you are trying to uh map out what are the what are the organisms that are present out here very often very often you won't see these animals uh right away right you will see signs of these animals and these are found if you track if you know how to track animals and their signs these are what you will most often see in a forest in direct method used in census okay cause of different animals okay so yes so we're getting uh, various different uh, answers out here so i think most of you have gotten this image right so all of you can see pug marks and it's definitely pug marks of a 
a big cat like a tiger so these are tiger pug marks um, so when you take photos usually of pug marks how do you take a photo of pug marks what should you be using when you take a photo pen okay why do you use a pen you're right um, renal why why would you use a pen for comparison for comparison to scale okay yes so that is very important right when you click an image of any wildlife sign you have to click it with a reference object that you are carrying with you and you know the size of so most often when people click photos of any of wildlife signs they use a scale for reference if you don't have a scale you use a pen because you know the length of a pen if you don't have a pen people use coins if you don't have coins people as you can see in these two images out here there are shoes because people know shoe size right so it is an easy reference so you should use a scale when you click a photo or even if you can't maybe suppose if it is something like this on a tree that you can see you would put your hand probably near it as a scale for reference so that you know what is the size and why is it important to have a scale to compare to what to differentiate what <laughs> comparison to human why why age uh no not really age not age size yes why do you need to know size yes between different species yes so if i don't have a scale and if i show you a picture of a pug mark it could belong to that of a tiger a leopard a jungle cat a house cat you would never know right i mean there might be some minor differentiation factors but uh, probably having a scale would enable you to eliminate a lot of different options so for you to identify what it is you need to have a scale so it could be so okay so scales are very important and uh, looking at pug marks are important field signs as well this is an example of a carnivore but you can also find uh, examples of other man other mammal um, footprints as well so uh, what about this image out here what do you think this is of the on the side of a tree these two images on the bottom right what do you think these are bear okay what else what else could it be so it's definitely something that might uh, move on trees or be at some level so yes it could be it could be a bear it is a monkey okay monkey because okay, so let me give you a clue yes so it is definitely an animal with strong claws right so uh, good point prashanta uh, what could what could be animals with small uh, strong claws i'm not sure about monkeys but uh, probably yeah panda no okay let's move closer back to this is from india these are all images from india um this is not a panda leopard tiger uh you have primates and bears sloth bear yeah that could uh yeah slot bears etc but actually this is not a picture uh, of a claw mark from any of these animals most likely we don't know for sure this is clicked from one of uh, our field sites where we work this is most probably of a malabar giant squirrel have you all heard of the malabar giant squirrel i'm going to put the name
so if you look up the squirrel it is a large squirrel a tree arboreal squirrel that you will see up in the forest okay anagha says yes yes it's uh, quite colorful it has many different colors and their claws are extremely sharp so these are quite common in the forest where we do our field work and uh, they have extremely sharp claws that lets them hang on branches and also scurry up the trees so the uh, this is possibly a claw mark of a malabar giant squirrel what about the next image to the left of that what is this what is this an image of cat yes correct so yeah this is a scat of uh, some animal and um, it might be uh, we we still don't know what it could be of it could either be of a large cat or some um other mammal maybe a dhol or something like that i'm not really sure but yeah scat okay what does scat mean scat means droppings or feces or poop in general so a term for uh, fecal matter is known as scat scat are any kind of droppings animal droppings that you might find and in this case it is uh, done by a mammal done by animals for sterility marking uh which uh, uh, which sign are you talking about mrina for territory marking are you talking about the scratch mark or are you talking about the scat okay i'm not sure okay what about the last image towards the extreme left what is this an image of any idea oh the scratch marks okay fine uh i'm not sure if they do it as a sign of marking or sharpening i no idea of the context so yeah okay so tell me what is this an image of this image out here footprint footprint of an elephant okay any other guesses <laughs> taking a hole okay elephant feet okay what else mammal footprint okay Okay so it turns a species two people say it as elephant any other guesses okay we all agree it's a mammal footprint but of the mammals Okay, so uh, Samia and uh, Prashanta say elephant. Nishant says hippo. Okay. Uh, no, this is again from India. So Prashanta and uh, Samia are correct. It is indeed the footprint of an elephant. So what else could be of that size? So you can see a person standing next to it as well, uh, and you can use that for scale and size difference. So. it is the footprint of a huge mammal which is an elephant and normally if you see a lot of these circular uh, kind of um, depressions in the soil or soft sand near any water body or otherwise you have to be a little uh, alert and aware because it shows the sign of an elephant around and you and if you are on foot by any chance you do not want to be in close quarters of an elephant because it can be quite dangerous so 
elephant and rhino footprint i think uh, rhino footprints would be much smaller and also the foot shape i don't know what is a rhino foot look like definitely much smaller much 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 smaller so yeah if you look at a rhino foot let me switch this to this tab so if you see a rhino's foot you see these uh, is the stamp visible you can see these three four it's it's a completely different shape altogether and it is much smaller than an elephant's foot so yeah the shape differences are a giveaway and uh, in this might only be uh, questionable or you might need to pay attention to this only if it is in an area which has elephants and rhinos but if it is very important to also geotag the location so if you don't know where the footprint is from it becomes a little bit difficult right so if it is in an area with elephant and rhino but definitely elephant and rhino footprints would be easier to distinguish between all right so let's move on so a little more about organization so the stomach consists of several layers of tissues broadly categorized into mucosa submucosa muscularis subseriosa and seriosa this collection of tissues makes a stomach a what so an easy one come on elephant fourth row rhino three toes are you still seeing the rhino tab do you not see has the slide not changed i have another question that's up okay organ prashanta says organ okay okay sanka just googled thanks sanka for the uh, inf- information okay so yes uh as uh, hopefully you all agree this is an example of an organ right because uh, all these tissues come together to make an organ okay let's move on to the next question so uh can somebody tell me which is the most diverse biome is it the temperate rainforest is it a tropical rainforest is it the temperate grassland or is it a desert type of biome you can use tropical the... rainforest okay so rajeshri says tropical Trop- tropical rainforest okay rajeshri says tropical rainforest and so does prashanta shankha marinal om any other answers any more answers tropical rainforest okay nishan says tropical rainforest Okay so yes it is definitely the tropical rainforest that's the correct answer any idea as to why it could be the tropical rainforest as being the most diverse temperature okay rainfall okay what else yes rajeshri and himanshu 
Yes, ma'am. Actually, when I'm actually the main, the main reason is that because of the stable climatic condition and which favors the rich in biodiversity. This is the most probable reason that the tropics are rich in biodiversity. Okay. Okay. Could you would you like to explain that a little more? Um, so because what, of its locations. Because of the location. So because of the, where is the location of these uh, tropical rainforests? Yes, yes. So so yeah, Sankar says. Because of its latitude and latitude positions. Right. So latitudinally, it is quite close to the equator, right? As uh, Sankar mentioned. Yes. yes. it is uh, very close to the equator and uh, water and fire element i'm not sure of the what uh, exactly you mean by this prashanta but uh, it is definitely suitability of temperature and climatic conditions including a lot of rainfall that is abundant more energy availability sun okay sure yes so um this region receives a uh, ample amount of sunlight all the time right so this results in uh, this area being able to support a diversity of life and you do have the tropical rainforests as the most diverse of all the biomes Okay, let's go on to the next question. Okay, so what is seen in the picture out here, and which regions experience this kind of a scene? More rainfall, more sunlight. Yes, that's correct, Prashanta, for the tropical system. So, what do you see in the picture out here? what is what is the first thing that comes into your come to your mind okay sure it's a forest beautiful forest beautiful forest okay apart from a uh, wallpaper uh what else what else do you see okay we're getting closer deciduous forest mm Yes, ish. Where is where are these kind of forests most common? Okay. Yes, you are absolutely right. Mineral. It is a temperate forest. So, can you uh, all maybe talk a little bit more about this? Autumn. Yes, that's correct. so you see autumn okay so what is this autumn season mid latitudes okay temperate forest okay withering of leaves right so uh, they shed their leaves all together so what kind of biome would this be you are all correct you are all moving on in the right direction so it is a the biome of a temperate forest where you uh, are able to see the autumn season and this is a period where these trees these uh, deciduous trees they shed their leaves all together so why does this happen out here do you see autumn in india why do they shed their leaves what do you think sure they are deciduous forests they are they are called deciduous forests because these are the type of forests where they shed their leaves uh why does this happen and what is so different of a uh, like this kind of a habitat as compared to what you see in india okay to prevent transpiration why should you prevent transpiration unfavorable conditions okay so what's happening in these areas which is different from uh yes so they have harsh winters 
correct to prevent water loss snow fall harsh winters yes that's correct so these areas do experience harsh winters to survive winters yes correct so so now we are getting closer to what the bigger picture is about uh, so tell me what is the difference between a forest like this and okay leaves could burst in winters or uh, they just won't survive right because they'll be covered with snow or it'll be like too cold for uh, there are a lot of climatic conditions that are not favorable for the trees to uh, be producing leaves at that point of time so tell me what is different between this kind of climate at this time versus india what happens in india do we have autumn in india no we don't that i think we all agree but why don't we have it we have the monsoon instead yes correct right so we have heavy rainfall that comes uh, so what is the so if i were to categorize the differences both areas see differences in what i'm looking for a particular term here yes okay rainfall definitely and insulation insulation uh okay sure but what is like the main difference precipitation and temperature okay so now you're getting a little closer sunlight yes so what are the differences in this precipitation and temperature classify as what do you see for example across the year in a temperate region versus a tropical region can you comment on the differences in precipitation and temperature and sunlight etc not not abiotic factors i mean yes of course these are all abiotic factors but what are the differences in these abiotic factors or presence of these abiotic factors in these temperate and tropical areas so we talked about rainfall but there is a particular term right okay do you want a hint does everyone want a hint yes no <laughs> yes okay it's the same in the topics but changes in the temperate area yes more precipitation more temperature less precipitation less temperature okay yes that is altitude no we are not talking about elevation here not altitude uh, out here but uh, so building on what uh, abhyartana and mrinal have said so mrinal is uh, mrinal said it is same in the tropics but changes in tem- temperature area so what is this term known as building on what abhyartana also mentions what are these differences term does especially what mrinal has mentioned it is same in the topics what is same humidity okay sure but i'm looking for a broader overarching term that includes yes humidity also humidity rainfall temperature etc it's something you all know okay i'll give you a hint we see we see stark differences in this in higher latitudes or temperate regions but climatic conditions okay so what is this term known as days are shorter yes correct you are all getting closer but what is this term known as what what is different what do you see in this picture somebody already mentioned what what they see in this picture i think somebody did mention um okay so someone had mentioned yes correct seasonal differences there we have it 
so you see so where do you see higher seasonal differences in which area tropics or temperate okay lakshya says tropics tropics temperate okay any more any more replies high seasonality is seen in which landscape tropics or temperates high differences in seasonality okay lakshya why do you think temperate is correct is both summer and winter extremities tend to be present yes so that's correct right like in india because india is a tropical like closer to the tropics than the temperates you see very tropical kind of climate and you don't see a high level of seasonality right you mostly see the monsoon season and the non monsoon season yes surely but we don't have like a summer and a winter with stark differences right it's not like it's snowing at one point of time and it's not like it's blazing hot the other point of time india has six seasons where in india do you have six seasons that is uh, <laughs> not at all uh, true if you compare india as a whole you'll probably not see six seasons but if you compare yes europe they do have different seasons you see summer you see spring you don't see spring summer uh, autumn and winter in india right because most of the trees are not deciduous trees they are tropical trees and you find them having leaves all throughout the year because they have yes that's correct brenal they receive same amount of sunlight throughout the year they in bengali we see six seasons okay that's an interesting term but uh, no we don't see six seasons in uh, india not at all um but i that this might have some traditional reference into this uh but yes we do receive the same amount of sunlight throughout the year so b- b- these trees don't need to shed their leaves and they don't need to prepare for a harsh condition and they also receive ample amount of uh, rainfall throughout the year and you don't need to shed leaves so temperate regions do exhibit higher degree of seasonality than the tropical regions can you does any can anyone comment about the biodiversity in this area you can just take a guess what will be the biodiversity in this area like do you think they will be specialized or not specialized and if you think they are specialized what kind of specializations would they have it's an open it's an open thing so we already agreed that there is a high amount of seasonality in temperate regions what do you think will be what do you think the animals will be like out here yes that's a good point they might be hibernating in the winter because they need to have adaptations that enable them to survive right these harsh conditions what else what else could be what else could be there migration yes that's another thing sure that's a good point any other points in addition to migration and hibernation
okay so there are a lot of anim- uh, uh, there are a lot of animals that uh, store food right so that's another adaptation so they have thick fur that they grow uh, or a thick coat that they grow during the winter season and they also store food so you might have seen uh, animals like for example squirrels a popular example they scurry and they scurry around and store these nuts or acorns in certain locations um so that um, you know they can find it later during the winter when they have uh, less access to a lot of these food resources right so that is an example of an animal adaptation in a uh, temperate kind of region all right so moving to the next question uh, which biome has a coldest temperature for a forested biome is it the chaparral is it the moist deciduous temperate forest is it the tundra is it the taiga or is it a tropical forest okay so one guess for c what else c tundra okay rajeshri uh, says c c c lot of c tundra 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 Abhyartana says Taiga. She says, okay. The rest everybody says C. Don't draw. Okay. What else? Any other guesses? Anybody else? never heard of a okay so yeah a is also a kind of biome so my s is d this is because of extreme cold weather conditions okay so uh, i think uh, most of you have guessed c tundra but that's uh, actually the wrong answer because you do not so if you read the question a little bit carefully you look at the coldest temperature for a forested biome there are no forests in the tundra right so the tundra uh, landscape consists of uh, you know very short plants like shrubs and grasses you have moss and lichen etc because it doesn't have the uh, climatic conditions to support a forest right but the coldest forested biome that you can get is actually the taiga forests which are quite these high elevation alpine region they'll be classified by pine forests etc so the taiga region has vegetation which consists of these uh, fir trees or coniferous trees they usually have uh, evergreen trees that uh, don't shed their leaves like for example pine they have needles they have modifications of leaves uh, that are in the form of pine needles instead of flat broad leaf leaves and uh, the chaparral biome is actually a kind of um, different type of biome which is the you have um grasslands right so they are they they consists of like shrubs and uh, grassland type of habitat so and they are quite close to some uh let's say water resource yeah so they used to like dry summer type vegetation okay so the answer for this is the taiga actually not the tundra okay, let's move on to the next question so which of the following would represent an ecosystem is it a lake a fish tank a prairie or all of the above guess for all of the above 
all of the above okay what else for <laughs> Vinata switches from all of the above to lake Swamya says lake Laksha Jamal and Rajeshri say all of them are ecosystems right so the correct answer is actually four which is all of these because uh, all these landscapes have biotic and abiotic factors present in them right so even if you take a fish tank you don't see a fish tank with just water and fish in it right you have like a substrate which is like some sand or some soil with some rocks pebbles or um, you know uh, driftwood or wood pieces in it along with some plants and animals so it does represent a uh, self-sufficient like ecosystem in itself and uh, a lot of these fish tanks are uh, self-sustainable and quite sustainable themselves because the plants will produce the oxygen required for the um, animal life and the animals will release carbon dioxide and uh, it, this will be close to a light source which will uh, provide for the plants to uh, you know uh, conduct photosynthesis and generate food so yeah so the answer to this is actually uh, four which is all of the above okay let's move to the next question Okay, so has anyone heard of this term known as sky islands? Yes, no. And then if anyone has, what are they? No, okay. No. I, I need your uh, answers for this before we go ahead. So tell me, have you heard about Skylands or not? Thumbs up, thumbs down. No, no, okay. What about the rest? Okay. okay okay has anyone heard of this anyone heard of skylands remotely in passing in any reference in any article okay all right so i think uh, all of you have not heard of these uh, sky island uh, habitats so basically sky islands are high elevation mountain structures that are present in mostly tropical or temperate areas but uh, they are classified by a different type of ecosystem altogether and uh, out here are images of sky islands in in three different continents so the top right uh, image is of a sky island in the eastern arc mountains in africa this is of some andean sky islands from the us um the, which is the americas which also extends into mexico and uh, these are an example of sky islands in india which is uh, present in the western ghats in fact so this landscape on the east uh, on the left side is uh, what where uh, most of the members of our lab do research in so um, i have attached links to all these sky islands we 
please feel free to go through these links when you get access to this ppt i'll be sharing this after the class but uh, if we talk about the shoda sky islands there it's a very interesting landscape so uh, these are um, areas that are found about 1400 meters above sea level and as you can see the uh, the clouds do come down so at a point you do if you stand on the top of this uh mountain out here you will see all the clouds below and uh, it's uh, very interesting because it consists of two types of landscape as you can see out here what do you think are the two types of landscape from this image that is shown here if you would like to guess what is the type of vegetation can you see two types of vegetation some lighter patches with some darker patches in it you have the lighter patches all over and then you have these pockets of these darker patches is this visible could you guess what they are in the image to the left yes no grassland okay yeah that's a good point so one of it yes indeed is grassland uh not shrubland it's probably not uh, clear from this image but they are forests actually they are forests and both of these are known as a shola ecosystem let me put that in the chat box so shola grassland plus forest so this is known as the shola sky islands of the sadavan eastern parts in india so this landscape is found only in india and uh, what's so special about this landscape is that you can find several types of uh, endemic flora and fauna so do you know what does endemic mean can anyone explain what is endemic the species restricted to a particular geographical area okay thanks shrinivasa yes it is a species restricted to a particular geographic area and uh, there are certain species of plants and animals that are endemic to the shola sky islands would anyone know of any examples of uh, species that are endemic to the shola sky islands so let me give you reference of a few places like if you have been to the nilgiris uh like uti or kunur or um, um let's say kodaikanal munnar etc all these locations are a part of the shola sky islands in the western ghats okay nilgiri thar sumlanta sundiana is sumlanta madam sumlanta sundiana is endemic to nilgiri yes correct so that is a good example so i'm just going to I think this is the spelling of it. Pardon me if I'm wrong. Actually, let me just find out the right spelling of what Srinivasa has just mentioned right now. Okay, so this uh, species you might have also heard of it. It is popularly known as the Kurinji. so that is the strobilanthus kuntiana that is also found in this area so yes that is an example of an uh species that is endemic to the shola sky islands so yes and renal says the nilgiri thar so yes definitely the nilgiri thar is endemic to the shola sky islands so i have an images of a few uh by diversity could you guess so i think one of them is already guessed if you would like to look at uh, images of 
the strobilanthus i will just put this up uh several there are several species of uh, kurinji flowers but uh, this is one that bloom only sometime in a couple of years so you will find these fields of violet all over the place so it's known as yes neela kurinji okay so but would uh, anyone like to guess what are all these other species that are given out here so one of them mirinal has already disclosed just just the nilgiri thar what are the others <laughs> white bellied blue robin okay so that's actually the old name but the name of the species is the nilgiri nilgiri shola keli is the bird is the nil gay so luckily what about the others any guesses so the lizard is also known as uh, this is the scientific name for the lizard i'm going to put it in the common name of this is known as the annamalai spiny lizard which is also endemic to these southern western ghats and high elevation oops where is the chat box uh the frog species out here is known as the kodai canal bush frog so frog kodai canal bush frog which is seen uh only out here and uh, what's interesting is that they also come in several different morphs right so they are not only yellow but they can be like brown or reddish pinkish even blackish they come in various different morphs but they are all the same species and any guesses for the tree species Daphne Filum nilgiriensis, the plant on the right. Oh yes, somebody has gotten it. Lakshya says uh, nilgiri Daphne. That's correct. So that's the plant species. All right. So good. So now you have an idea of some of the biodiversity that is present in these uh, high elevation Shola Sky Islands that are endemic to the Western Ghats, and these species are only found here in the entire world. They are not found anywhere else. Okay. So let's move on into something a little more complex. Uh, so here we see a figure. and uh, let me explain the figure a little bit so on the x axis you see number of samples and uh, on the y axis you see number of otus now what are these otus the full form of otus are known as operational taxonomic units this is nothing for now just for simplicity you can consider them as species type uh, i should put a link of the paper out here uh, i will put that in uh, you can access that when you have access to this presentation but let's just say species are on the y axis which is equal to otus and um 
on the x-axis you have number of samples so so the graph given alongside denotes the number of species of plants and arthropods found in the diet of the lesser prairie chicken so number of sample samples that is on the x-axis basically means the number of scat samples so they have collected poop samples from these uh, different uh, individuals of this lesser prairie chicken and they have tried to see what this animal eats and there is a special technique known as meta barcoding by which you can analyze the scat samples of any species and you can find out what are the species that it eats so in this case they have a broad classification of plants and arthropods and here you can see the number of species that have been uh, detected over the number of samples collected so what does this figure actually represent any idea any guesses so this figure or this graph actually represents what there is a term for this anybody has anyone heard of a species accumulation curve have you gone through the lectures these are there in your lectures yes no thumbs up thumbs down we are here to discuss so yeah don't worry species accumulation curve have any of you heard of this okay nal has heard of it what about the others okay mrenal would you like to maybe try to explain don't worry about being right or wrong that's okay but in your own words would you like to explain what you see in this figure out here don't worry about the accuracy or anything of it so um so yeah so you can see two lines that are going up and up here you can see a blue line that denotes the plants and then you can see a green line that shows the arthropods so for 1 to 150 samples taken the number of species that have been detected are so from this graph uh lesser prairie chicken consume more plants more types of plants or more types of arthropods what is what is shown here does it consume more type of more species of plants or arthropods okay so it consumes more plant species right uh how can you say that you can say that by the curve you can see it consumes nearly over 200 species of plants and about 50 species of arthropods right so definitely it consumes more more variety of plants than um arthropods in their diet and uh, what can you say about the plant types so if you have not heard of this term this graph denotes a species so this denotes a species accumulation curve where you can see uh different types of uh, plants and arthropods that have been consumed by this uh, species known as the lesser prairie chicken it's nothing but a galliform chicken like species and uh, what you can see with the blue line for the plants at least that it is saturation it is saturating at about probably 
100 or at 90 it is going a little bit up but it's more or less kind of plateauing so this means that you need about 100 samples for you to capture the entire number or types of plants that this particular species consume right because if i go till 150 samples instead of 100 if i go take 150 samples it's not adding any new species to the possible diet of this animal is this uh, is this species accumulation curve clear or not to everybody if it is not clear could you please tell me if it is not clear this is important in ecology species accumulation curve clear yes no so these sessions are for you to understand otu okay what is otu otus are operational taxonomic units which are nothing but species otus here equal to species type so it is a cumulative curve so as we go from 0 to 250 they are the number of species that are increasing cumulatively so at 0 we have about 25 species if we go to uh, two samples we probably have encountered another species and this goes exponentially increasing till about uh, maybe like let's say this is about 10 to 20 20 samples so about here at halfway through at about 25 samples you can see there is an exponential increase in the number of species types and then as you go increasing gradually we are adding maybe a couple of species uh as we analyze more number of scat samples is that is that clear does that make sense after a particular time saturation comes and no more species found that is correct so after a uh, not Uh, after a particular time, after we have sampled over a hundred samples of scat of this particular species, we have seen that we are not able to add any more plant species in their diet. So basically, a hundred samples is enough for you to uh, capture the entire dietary uh, niche of plants of this particular prairie chicken species. yeah so if we uh, is does that make sense manana so we are trying to see what are the types of species of plants that the prairie chicken consumes by collecting uh, scat or fecal samples of this bird and beyond the 100 scat samples we see that there is no more additional uh plant species that are included in this particular bird's diet does that make sense if there's something not clear please uh, ask me at this point of time everyone's understood okay so i'm assuming everybody has understood this i am going to move on we are going to do something a little bit technical right now so i'm sure all of you have heard of the uh, simpson's index to measure the uh, biodiversity and that is denoted by the letter d you have an example of different species type denoted by these different colors and shapes and uh, the formula to calculate simpson's diversity is given out here uh, maybe you could take a few minutes and try and calculate the value of d given out here and let's discuss this after a bit
if somebody does not uh, understand anything about the formula given out here please ask me when anyone has an answer feel free to put it in the chat okay this is new to you okay who else is this new to diversity indexes please could you raise your hands okay yeah uh, feel free to use the chat box or raise your hand so that we have an idea of whom all this is new to for those that are aware of this please uh, proceed to calculate So this is new to three people. This is definitely uh, shown in your lectures and covered. But uh, we are here to discuss and we can definitely discuss more. Is anyone calculating here? Yes, no, can someone just thumbs up to this because then we can wait if they are calculating. Is no one calculating this? Is someone calculating this? Yes or no? no one is responding so i am not sure what we should do uh, so for those who are not aware and would like to calculate let's look at the equation given out here it's shown summation of ni into ni minus one so how many type of species how many species type can you see in the image given alongside please use the chat box how many species are present Okay, so we all can agree that there are three species present. So let's name these species orange, O for orange, B for blue and P for purple, O, B, P. So can you tell me what are the number of uh, individuals of each of these species? You can type it down. Yeah. If you type them with the code, it might be easier. So, 7636B607. Yeah. And P3. Okay, correct. So, now that is all actually your N. Okay. So, for each, so your numerator consists of summation of N into N minus 1. So, you now have for n equal to o for n equal to p for n equal to for n equal to orange for n equal to blue for n equal to purple you have n into n minus 1 so for n equal to orange you will count 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 so 7 into 7 minus 1 that is 6 then you will do plus uh, n equal n uh, blue 1 2 3 4 5 6 that will be so 7 into 6 plus 6 into 5 plus n equal to purple uh, 3 into 2 so this will be your numerator okay does this make sense yes no is this clear Okay, great. And 
yes so now for your denominator n total is the total number of individuals that are present out here yes so that is 16 and 16 n in capital n into capital n minus 1 that is 16 into 15 so now could you all do the math and tell me what is the answer for this can you calculate this and tell me what do you get Seven into six plus uh, six into five plus three into two on the numerator divided by sixteen into fifteen. What's the answer? Give me the answer. Now you know what goes in the numerator and the denominator. You can use your phones and quickly calculate this. Okay, zero point three one. What about others? Are you getting the same answer? Anybody else apart from Prashanta has done the calculations? No? Nobody? 0 0.68, okay. What else? Any other answers? Anyone else? 0 0.3. Okay. Okay, so most of you have got uh, 0 0.3. So that is the correct answer 0 0.3. So do you know what scale does this index range between what is the range of this what does this mean what does 0 0.3 mean does it mean high or low diversity what does it mean so d is actually the simpson's index d and simpson's index of diversity is actually denoted as 1 minus d Okay, so we will say 0 to 1 and uh, higher the value of D, what is the diversity, high or low? High diversity means, high value means high diversity or low diversity for this, for D. So 0 0.35 means high diversity or low diversity. Low value is high diversity. Okay, thanks Prashanta. Yes, so out here the value ranges from 0 to 1 and a low value denotes high diversity. So when you calculate actually the Simpson's diversity index, you do 1 minus D and that is a more intuitive explanation of uh, having a high diversity or a low diversity, right? So this means that the... Uh, is this clear to everyone? Was this okay to calculate? Does anyone have any doubts? Okay, thanks. So Nishant has understood. Is there another formula given previously? So, so there are so there are various formulas that can be used to uh, calculate diversity, and it depends on whichever you want to use. There are certain formulas that take certain things into account and others don't it depends on your data set but usually if they have asked you to calculate simpson's diversity index you would calculate it like this if they have asked you to calculate shannon's diversity index they will calculate it in another way based on the shannon's diversity index formula both of them are diversity indexes and might represent different things uh, so it is uh, 
important it is also probably good to calculate both indexes and present it so they are just simple formulas is this uh, clear to everyone does anyone have any doubts in this Okay, yeah so the next question that I have is a little bit more of a discussion to do so maybe we can do that uh, next class different values come in different formulas yes different values will come in different formulas because they'll have different scales there are some indexes that range between minus 1 to 1 you can have 0 to 1 you can have different values you can have 0 to whichever integral values so they are not doing the same thing like the shannon's diversity index and the simpson's diversity index denote different things different aspects of diversity right so shannon's index usually uh, looks at uh, uncertainty of species identity and simpson's uh, index measures like a probability of if you pick two species uh, if you pick two individuals or so what is the probability of it being a different species or not so that is what simpson's index means so the probability of two individuals drawn randomly belong to the same species or not uh, if you do a 1 minus d and if it is uh, a high value like in this case it will be 1 minus 3 which will be 0.7 it means you have a 0.7 probability of uh, two species that are randomly drawn being different species altogether if the probability is low which means that if you draw two, two individuals they belong to the same species your it means that the diversity is very low right but uh, shannon's uh, diversity index looks at the uncertainty of the identity of samples so we can uh, it uh, also more uh, uh, takes into account species richness for example so um, um, like rare species will have a greater um, you know uh, species richness will be given more of an importance in um, Shannon's index and rare species will have more of an importance in Shan Shannon's index as compared to a Simpson's index. So you will get different uh, values and it depends on what the formula is trying to interpret or what is it trying to calculate and bring out. So it's good to always read about uh, different diversity indexes before ap applying it because that's going to help interpret your data in a better way. Any more questions regarding anything in the lecture so far covered? No, no. Okay, all right. So then uh, we shall close the class today. It was. Uh, good to uh, see you all today for week two and uh, we will meet again next week uh, i will be taking class on tuesday instead of monday and uh, yeah i will be there for next tuesday's class so yeah thank you all for joining uh Sankha, you have some questions regarding the course okay what are the questions you have yeah those who are done you are free to leave thanks for joining in today Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thanks. Uh, who is this course for? Uh, great. It is for anybody who wants to take it and uh, anybody who would like to learn about wildlife ecology. Anything else? Industry support was mentioned. Uh, where was this mentioned? Sorry. Uh, 
uh, i'm not sure about this industry support uh, are you reading this from anywhere or where was it actually mentioned in context to what i'm not sure the website itself okay so it might be people who want to get into uh, something in terms of maybe wildlife consultancy etc in joining the industry so there are a lot of uh, ecological conservate co- uh, consultancies that do biodiversity uh, surveys and analysis and ecosystem health surveys you have the environmental impact assessment etc so uh, people who do such things do need to have a broad knowledge of ecology and how do ecological systems work so this is this course is probably like a primer as to what you could encounter in those kind of industries but uh, definitely there are detailed coursework for specific like for example if you are doing something of uh, waste management etc there will be more comprehensive uh, courses related to waste management pollution reduction using renewable non renewable renewable resources but this course in wildlife ecology gives you a primer to all different kinds of avenues of ecology so yeah that's what it means hope that answers your question all right anything else if not uh, let's meet next tuesday could i get any work related to conservation after this course uh probably not because this is uh, this is just like a primer degree it will definitely add to your knowledge but it is not a comprehensive course like uh, uh you do have a lot of uh, masters and bachelor's courses in maybe environmental education or uh, uh environmental resource management etc so um if you would need to look for job perspectives definitely i feel having a degree in this field might be more helpful than just this course this course is just a primer short term courses okay i am not sure of any short term courses that would provide you a qualification to take up a job but uh, it might be worth posting this on the um discussion group so if there are people who are aware of this they can definitely uh, help you find such courses so do post this on the discussion forum sankha yeah thanks mrinal okay all right see you next week bye